First of all, thank you very much for such an inspiring uh, presentation. Now we will focus on a paper, how humans may coexist uh, with Earth, the case uh, for suboptimal systems. Just quickly about content overview. We will start by, uh, next slide, sorry. <laughs> we will start by uh, briefly summarizing the uh, paper, and then we will focus on uh, different points that we would like to uh, discuss during the presentation. And at the end, we collected all questions, so it will be easier for you to answer and for discussion mm -hmm. later. Uh, so starting by a summary, paper, uh, the paper challenges the notion that sustainability oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the paper challenges the notion that sustainability always requir requires optimization uh, and actually it explores a concept of uh, resilience and its relation uh, to uh, individual and also to collective uh, interest. Uh, also we have that uh, paper suggests that suboptimal system actually can uh, lead us to uh, robust uh, outcomes and uh, through various examples uh, the paper actually illustrate connection between um, collective resilience on one side and also uh, suboptimal aspects uh, for individual uh, within uh, that system. Um, I would like to finish also with that. <laughs> However, uh, in the Anthropocene era, uh, where we have that uh, human activity actually uh, signific significantly affect uh, Earth's uh, functioning, uh, this paper suggests uh, suboptimality as a potential path towards uh, resilience. So first, um, point that I would like to discuss, next slide, is actually a role of uh, suboptimality and uh, paper in paper it is addressed as a state in which randomness, heterogeneity, slowness, redundancy and other, other forms of inefficiencies at individual levels lead to a robust uh, outcome. As you said, uh, in the world uh, currently driven by performance at all scales and in uh, all uh, sectors. Uh, this paper actually suggests that suboptimality uh, may, uh, may provide us alternative uh, framework. But here, uh, due to this definition, we can also uh, think about other nor normative ideas and uh, in same sense raise the question, how does uh, sub suboptimality conflict with uh, other normative ideas? Actually, uh, the idea uh, of suboptimality may conflict with uh, normative ideas related to um, individual freedoms related to social justice, uh, democracy, and so on, uh, and all that in a sense that suboptimal system um, actually involve choices and uh, strategies that prioritize resilience, even if we have situation that that choices and that strategies uh, actually may restrict uh, individual freedoms. So uh, these priorities and promoting collective outcome may actually come into conflict with um, other normative ideas. So we would like to hear your opinion <coughs> on it. And also like uh, about second point, uh, actually, uh, Examples from uh, articles suggest that a uh, beneficial outcome may arise uh, in the long uh, term from such a strategy, at least in considered uh, sectors. But um, <coughs> although suboptimality is uh, likely to be a key element for our um, sustainable future, let's say, also uh, we can uh, we could be possibly blinded <coughs> by, let's say, um, attractive prospects of short-term efficiency. And in that sense, it cannot lead us uh, towards uh, resilience. Uh, also, in that sense, we can talk about short-term versus uh, long-term uh, conflicts. What else I wanted to mention here is that uh, actually in the Anthropocene, a key challenge for future will be to assess whether such a paradigm could be applicable in the larger scale when we talk about relation between societies and ecosystems. And uh, actually here we can talk about conflicts between uh, short-term economic interest and long-term um, ecosystem sustainability. So we would like also to hear your opinion uh, uh, and to discuss more about how to balance this uh, trade-offs. Uh, and uh, due to that, I also uh, start thinking about uh, practical uh, implementation. And although the uh, paper itself does not address directly the role of politics and uh, political relations and the power relations and power dynamics, I would like also to hear your opinion uh, on uh, how we could uh, incorporate politics and the power relation into this uh, framework. Thank you. So I am going to um, talk a little bit about the getting inspiration from biology part. So one thing we appreciated about the paper is how it uh, talks of this unifying theme across multiple scientific disciplines, that of two paradigms, one of the individual versus that of the collective, and that of optimality and efficiency at the individual level, 
versus that of collective resilience. So we are using resilience and robustness interchangeably here. Uh, next slide. So I, uh, what we think is that these two paradigms underlie two different ontological, competing ontological views of the world, that is what the world is made up of and the relationship between the cons constituents of the world. On the <coughs> one hand, the traditional mechanistic view of science is that systems can be analyzed in a top-down manner by breaking them down to their individual constituents and that the system outcome is the sum of its parts. On the other hand, the, so the parts could be whether they are molecules in a system of gases or the representative homo economicus actor of economic systems, whereas the systems view, which is emphasized in the paper, sees systems as being heterogeneous with mutually interacting particles and the emergent properties at a higher level of organization cannot necessarily be analytically predicted from the properties of the individual constituents, which is why, as it is argued, individual efficiency may not lead to systems efficiency in the sense of robustness. And yeah, the systems revolution in part has taken place due to the explosion of data science and more and more information since the 1980s. Can go to the next one? Okay, so this uh, schematic which ecological system where the users, the government, resource units, these are all heterogeneous interacting agents and commons literature really highlights how individual suboptimality can lead to system robustness. Um, okay, next slide. So that brings us to our next set of questions, which is uh, to what extent are these paradigms actually dichotomous or mutually exclusive? Because even in the paradigm of systems robustness, several individual components still pursue efficiency like Viewing a cell as a complex system does not discount the examples of efficiency that have been. Like protein folding is still an entropy maximizing problem. So what is the role of efficient technologies as units that function? How, how do they relate to the um, paradigm of robustness or should we completely do away with that? And secondly, this is a subtlety of the argument, suboptimality, as you argued, may be necessary, but is it sufficient for resilience and what else do we have to consider? So, So, uh, <coughs> sorry, I'm a bit sick, so voice might give up. Um, yeah. So I have. Um, I'm mostly going to focus my comments on, on the point of optimality itself, and um, the first of them focuses on to which point are humans actually to, to which one of are humans actually optimal in in their behavior, and there seems to be um, an idea in the literature that individuals tend to act suboptimally and populations act optimally, or at least optimality tends to form itself at the level where uh, survival, where the payoffs and um, um, costs for action are felt and exercised. Um, so this makes us think of um, two different problems. And one of them is that optimality only makes sense when it is related to a given objective. This is, you can optimize for a lot of different things and at a lot of different levels. Um, and that is something that is not, I, would, I, think, I did not think was very clear or clearly explained uh, how we can actually, um, cons how we can consider optimality in such a way um, that it can also be seen, and I have an, an example here from the presentation from today, that it be seen as a um, sustainable uh, and um, resiliency, and resiliency enhancing. With the example, for example, that was given during the presentation with uh, enzymes um, ha uh, having their optimum at 40 degrees. And I do believe that uh, when we are using optimality considering various variables, and in this case, the trade-off between having an organism that functions and doesn't cook itself to death, um, maybe 
this balance between individuals, individual suboptimalities leads us to a, leads us to a big <coughs> level of optimality. And this is what I wanted to ask. To what extent is it possible to, say, optimize for resilience? And um, the second question that I wanted to, to ask and bring about is how suboptimal behavior uh, or, or optimal behavior can depend on the level of aggregation we're looking at it. So we're looking at the cell level, at the organ level, at the individual level, at the family level, at the social level. Something can be um, optimal, and here, of course, it will still depend on what we're considering to be the objective we're optimizing for, but something can be optimal or suboptimal depending on that level. I can be, I can be doing something that's beneficial for me as an individual, but it is bad for society. And <clears throat> in a way, going through um, um, as we go through the op optimality and suboptimality in different in, in different levels, I think it leaves it a bit muddled when we're thinking about of optimality. If we're thinking it at what level exactly are we thinking about it, and the, and which level of suboptimality do we ne really need to achieve sustainability? Um, in this case, just uh, also to connect back to, to, your, to your presentation, is the idea when, when, when you said that the most optimal way of planting a tree <coughs> is to just put it in a, a basket of water with nutrients. Uh, and in that case, I'd ask, well, that, because you said that it was the most performative way. And um, it is performative for, for whom? For the humans who plant the tree, who want the tree to go fast, or is it performative for the tree who has its interests to stay alive in, in the long term, stay alive and reproduce. So it's, uh, it would be interesting to hear your opinion on um, how basically how do we aggregate optimality and with, with whom are we uh, checking uh, the optimality with. Um, can you pass the next slide, please? Thank you. And the other one is the <coughs> idea, and this is a bit more philosophical, but um, moving a bit um, on the more higher level of abstraction. And um, it has to do with uh, how much this optimality really exists, that it's really a thing that we can uh, identify concretely and not just um, a, rhetoric, a rhetoric tool. Because in, especially in the economic literature, there is this very strong connection between optimality, rationality, and perfect information. Um, yet there have been um, a lot of studies that have, um, and then one, I I uh, quote here by uh, Marty Sen in 1977, that have uh, cast some doubt of, on the um, prerequisites for optimality, such as perfect foresight, perfect information, um, and also uh, the ability to make actual rational, rational decisions. And of course, this term, they're very loaded, and, and I'm sure by working with them, this has been a struggle when, when dealing with these sorts of terms, because rationality is considered almost generally to be a good thing. And being these terms uh, as, as politically and um, rhetorically loaded as they are, can we um, assume that they, they actually exist in the world as something as being optimal behavior that uh, governs our society, or is it just a way of justifying certain political actions by saying that they are rational, that they are optimal, but uh, you could have very different uh, behaviors being justified as being rational or, or, and optimal depending on different political preferences. Uh, so I think these are my, uh, my, my questions here, and now we have a uh, summary of, uh, okay. <laughs> of our discussion points to uh, make it more clear. I'll go, uh, yep. <laughs> it's nice to have the questions. Uh, uh, do I, I keep no, the mic? Yeah, okay, okay. I, I'm, uh, it's okay. I, I have uh, my own mic, so it's okay. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go in order. Uh, our current project politics for women is framework and find middle ground between suboptimal strategy and further. Center on individual interest. Okay, so the yeah the norm, normative point, right? So, uh, alors, maybe just just one point on resilience, just to uh, clarify as well. So when I was talking about resilience, I was talking about psychological resilience, which is the one that we use for economics um, or in the socio-economic world. When we say resilience in, e in economy, that's psychological resilience, bouncing back. But actually, in ecology, uh, there is another definition of resilience, yet another definition of resilience, which is the ability to persist, to adapt, and to transform in a dynamic world. 
That's the definition of uh, Karl uh, Folke in the so-called resilience center, which is much closer to robustness. But you see, now, when you talk about resilience, we don't know what we're talking about, right? So that's why <laughs> I prefer to talk only about robustness when I talk about robustness. <laughs> Just uh, FYI. But uh, I, I, then that's why we can interchange resilience and robustness if you <laughs> make sure that you specify that you're using the socio-ecological definition of resilience. That's it. OK, individual interest. So uh, yeah, that's a, that's a tough question, because of course, uh, if you are in the, um, in the robust uh, framework, Actually, you were uh, quoting um, Elinor Ostrom and the governments of the commons. Uh, that's a typical case where you actually, um, in some ways, reduce your individual freedom to preserve the common good, in some ways, right? So if you look at the eight principles of uh, Elinor Ostrom, the way to go is actually to uh, reduce a little bit of your, uh, your freedom or your um, individual freedom to manage, to make sure that you have a resource for the, for the group. So there's definitely a balance. I would say that nowadays, uh, the <laughs> our main problem, I think, is the imbalance on uh, individual interest, right? So we, we, are, we are living in a very individualistic uh, world. It is not a <laughs> breakthrough uh, discovery, right? And the technology that we uh, develop are fueling this. Uh, if you look at the uh, social networks, uh, now robots are actually more free than us in some ways, right? And, uh, in, and maybe we can go back to the definition of freedom. Because, I mean, the individual interest, I think it really goes down to what is freedom. So when you uh, define, uh, when you look at the definition of freedom, it's a negative definition. It's a negative definition of freedom. Freedom stops when the freedom of the others uh, starts, right? So that's, it's a negative definition of freedom. And when you uh, listen to the definition of freedom from uh, someone like uh, Elon Musk, for instance, so it's the libertarian definition of uh, freedom, it's an open bar. It's an open bar, right? There's no, there's no frame. You're just free to do whatever you want, right? So that's why on uh, X, X uh, Twitter, uh, now there's uh, less moderator, right? To be really free, to free, but in the liber libertarian way. So when you do this, when you're really free to do what you want, actually you go against freedom. It's that's where it's a little bit difficult to to manage because when you're really free to do what you want. Actually, uh, on uh, Twitter, on uh, X, uh, it's very clear that what happens on uh, X is your cognitive bias that are just, you know, fueling the conversation, right? It's a reflex conversation. There is no thinking. You just say your, the things. So you're free to say what you want. But actually, you're not so free because it's just your, <laughs> your, your subconscious, uh, you know, uh, reflex, your anger that is uh, talking to, the, to X, but it's not a thoughtful, uh, respectful uh, thought or like uh, writing. And so that's why, uh, I mean, the, um, I think for this, this, uh, this is a big question. I think it's, uh, it's, it's questioning the definition of freedom. And so the definition of freedom, the original definition of freedom is suboptimal. It is suboptimal because you have a frame and you want the frame to be uh, narrow enough so that within the frame you're free, but you want the frame, you don't want to go out of the frame. So it's a, really like the commons of uh, Elon Ostrom, but for freedom. Right? You need a frame. The, the first principle of uh, Ostrom is uh, limited access to the resource. It's the same for freedom. Uh, if you are into uh, physics, uh, what the freedom defin defined by the libertarians, it's not uh, anarchy, because eh? uh, anarchy it's, uh, it's um, uh, order without power. <laughs> That's the definition of anarchy. And uh, when you have the liberta li libertarian, you have uh, disor disorder with power. So it's just the opposite of anarchy. Yeah? What uh, Elon Musk is defending with uh, his uh, libertarian uh, freedom is more entropy, increase of entropy, just based on uh, your cognitive bias, right? I mean, I maybe I can send, I have written a tribute on this, so maybe it's uh, <laughs> because otherwise it's going to be too long to explain. But it's, I think this goes to a tr freedom. And if you include suboptimality in the definition of freedom, you'll go back to the original definition of freedom, and then you see that it's completely uh, compatible. Too. To what extent are the paradigms dichotomous mutually exclusive? So uh, performance and robustness. So they are, uh, you need a little bit of performance to be robust. So if you look at the curves I was showing earlier, it was a bell-shaped curve, right? So that means that in the, in the beginning, uh, you need a little bit of performance to be robust. If you have zero performance, you're not going to be robust. But that's not the main problem because this we achieve very quickly. Eh? So that's, uh, that's not an issue. We always get a little bit of performance. So that's not a problem. The problem is that performance self-justify itself. Good outlaw, rebound effect, uh, etc. Right? 
And so at some point, you perform and you forgot why you perform. Like the giant uh, wind turbines, it's a typical example where you, you want to make a wind turbine even bigger than the previous one, and you don't realize that you're going against <coughs> your goal, right? So they are mutually exclusive when you reach a certain threshold. And at a certain threshold, then the curves go down, right? And that's where they are mutually exclusive. And in the current world we are in, the main problem is that we are way beyond the threshold. We are way beyond the threshold. So that's why I'm saying that they are opposing each other. I mean, they are, they are really opposed concepts. You can't be very robust and very performant. It's physically impossible. But when you think about it, it's quite uh, simple because if you want to be very performant, you're going to narrow your objective and you're going, going to go very fast on that road. In a changing world, it's, uh, it's a dead end. If you want to be robust, you need to diversify you need to be redundant, you need to explore many uh, different routes, <coughs> even routes that are completely useless at uh, T0, let's say. So this is really not performant, but this is robust because the day the world is changing, you have a solution, you have something to, uh, to propose. Right? So I would say they are mutually, mutually exclusive in the current context because we've over-optimized the, the world. Oh, okay, I, I, I feel it, uh, okay, maybe it shouldn't be too long then. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, is suboptimality necessary or sufficient for resilience? So it's definitely necessary, but it's certainly not sufficient. <laughs> it's a necessary condition. So if you, if, you, uh, if you go, I mean, that's what I said. Robustness should be the first question to ask. You don't want to ask anything else first. Is my project robust, socio-ecologically robust? It's, uh, you, you're entering a situation, you want it to be robust. So it's a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient because you need to mobilize, right, for instance. So if you, uh, if you just say, my project is robust, everyone is going to follow me, of course, it's not going to work, right? Because we are still living in a world of performance, so you need to be a bit more uh, smart in some ways. Right? So maybe sometimes you need to use uh, the semantics of performance or maybe uh, like, uh, let's say, well, you don't want to be as robust as you would want. Maybe you want to find, uh, you know, uh, like a trajectory, like to do it uh, progressively. So all this is not really uh, robust in itself. It's more like a strategy to, uh, to go in that direction and to be, uh, well, well, the, the, the main point is to be successful in the end, right? So you, you want to ach achieve this transformation, but it can't be like, uh, if I say it in a different way, uh, radicality, when you're really radical, you are stuck in performance again. So if you suddenly say, I'm going to kill everyone that is not uh, you know, robust and I'm only going to keep the robust ones, that's super fragile <laughs> as well, right? Because we need everyone, right? We need everyone in the, in the next world, right? So, so I would say necessary, but not sufficient. Optimality is objective, uh, is objective specific. It also changes with the level of aggregation. Why not define it with the end goal of resilience? So this is, I think for me, this is more a question of semantics. Uh, when we uh, say that we can optimize resilience, actually in some ways we, um, we don't want to quit optimization. So I think, yeah, I see what you mean by saying that uh, we can find a path that is integrating uh, different things and it's sort of an optimization of resilience. But if we do this, uh, this is what's going to happen, right? We are going to uh, optimize this uh, bouncing back uh, trajectory and then in the end, we're going to reduce the margin of uh, the room, right? In a world that is fluctuating beyond belief, uh, meaning that, uh, the, I mean, the 21st century, we, we've seen the mega fires, the mega flooding and uh, all this, the social uh, turmoil and everything. But it's just, the, it's just the beginning in some ways, right? So we need to have a lot more room to face what's coming, right? And so if we optimize uh, resilience to start with, we're going to optimize with what we know right now. And uh, what's coming is unpredictable and even unthinkable. So if we agree that it's unpredictable and unthinkable, we should not optimize it. And it's also a way to be clear. We just drop optimization. We just completely drop it. We just explore, we experiment. If you think of a researcher that is doing a basic research, it's someone who is doing something completely useless at T0. That you can't optimize, right? Because it's completely useless. So the objective is completely uh, you know, out there. Right? But this is probably useful in the future when at some point we need some uh, new technology or some new uh, knowledge and that, that can't be optimized really because otherwise we would uh, stop some uh, area of research. Uh, does optimal behavior exist? Uh, so I think it doesn't exist, I agree, <laughs> but it's an interesting uh, thought experiment. When I say suboptimality, the idea is that there is indeed some uh, theoretical uh, optimum somewhere. 
and uh, that you, you want to go below that uh, theoretical optimum. But just that theoretical optimum is based on the current knowledge, right? And so, of, of course, we don't have a perfect knowledge of uh, what uh, is around us. So even that theoretical <laughs> optimum doesn't exist. So we need to be suboptimal <laughs> to an optimum that is probably not even the right optimum. So that's why it's another reason why you need to have even more room against that uh, optimum. Okay, maybe I'll stop here to have more questions. <laughs> Uh, my name is Mathias, I come from France, uh, but I'm still going to ask you in English. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, you, st you spoke about diversification as the opposition with the performance, which is narrowing the, the means and the goals. But an example of diversification of the goals is the example you began with, with the developing, uh, the, the 17 developing goals and you criticize it by explaining that this will introduce competition uh, between goals. Mm -hmm. So how do we uh, diversify our goals without introducing this competition you mentioned? Yeah, so you want to add them. So instead of choosing them. So if, uh, let's say, if you, let's talk about energy, right? So if you say, I'm going to, uh, I want to be autonomous on my uh, land, <coughs> so I'm going to put uh, solar panels, it's circular, and uh, I'm happy with this. Well, that's super fragile, right? Because the minute your solar panel is not working, you don't have any energy, so it's better to diversify, to have also a wind uh, turbine, uh, solar panels, uh, geothermia, I mean, like a different source of energy, right? To be robust on your territory, I mean, as a village or as a city, right? But that means that when you diversify, it doesn't mean that you always want to reach all the goals at the same time. So that means that you have maybe at some point you use solar energy, and you know that you have somewhere in your uh, garage something that is enough to build a windmill as well, right? And so that doesn't mean that you're going to build it right away. Just have it in addition to solar panels. It might be not functioning, but it's ready in case you need to use a different source of energy. So it's a, it's a very different thinking from the uh, SDGs because the SDGs, the goal is to reach all of them by 2030. And the uh, news flash is that we are not going to reach them. Right? We know, we know we are not going to reach them. I mean, there's a lot of uh, people in the UN who are talking about suspending the SDGs because they realize that it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The problem is not so much the SDGs because the, the names, I mean, we all agree on what they are, except for the economic growth, but the rest is very nice. Huh? Uh, we are all, it's politically correct, huh? so uh, that's fine. The problem is to say we are going to reach all of them by 2030. Then you're switching to performance again. When you diversify, it doesn't mean that you reach any goal. You just experiment, try things, right? So it's, it's, it's different. So I have, uh, I'm Dario from Italy. And nice. Thank you for your presentation. It was you. very, very interesting. Uh, how and if, if and how robustness is compatible with capitalism, since capitalism is, is, uh, is, perf is uh, competition and competition is performance, and and this is more of a provocation. How is and if is it uh, compatible with state democracies that we have today that are often short term, mm -hmm. uh, that have a short term thinking? Why sometimes looking at some uh, more autocratic forms of governments, they actually implement more robust policies or more diversified policies with a more longer term. So if it is compatible with democracy or which kind of democracy? Thank you. Okay, okay, so, uh, so yeah, uh, uh, robustness is not really compatible with capitalism, just to put it that way. When I said that it's a switch from the economy of property to the economy of uh, usage and uh, functionality, actually in some ways it's quitting capitalism. Uh, and especially the capitalism we are living now that is uh, financialized to an extent that is uh, beyond uh, belief, right? So actually when you think of the capitalism that was in the US in the 60s, just in the 60s, in the US, huh, the temple of capitalism, in the 60s you could see commercials of uh, big companies, uh, GNE for instance, that were, you know, like in the subway or anywhere, they, they were saying, we are proud to pay tax. Can you imagine this happening today, right? Like, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, Google saying, uh, we're proud to pay tax, right? No, it's, uh, we have, we've dropped that era, right, of social capitalism, right, where there was a sense of uh, the group, right? Now it's completely individualistic, completely financialized. So the capitalism has killed itself by <laughs> going in that road, right? And so I would say what we are in going to invent with robustness is a different kind of economic model that is much more diversified, much more local. And so the state democracy, they are compatible. 
with robustness. Absolutely compatible. Uh, the example is the um, uh, it's just a matter of uh, decentralization, basically. So you ca you, if you follow again the, the, the governments of the commons from uh, Ostrom, uh, but you, you see that actually one of the principles is that you need to have local autonomy, active autonomy on a territory, but it works only if you're recognized by an external entity. And that external entity, that's the state in some way. So you need a state, and the state democracy is really useful. The thing that is changing is the role of the leader in a state democracy. So when you're in the, in the world of performance, the state uh, leader is uh, the driver. <laughs> is the person that is going to lead the way, right? In the world of robustness, the person that is in charge is a facilitator. It's a very different role. So that means that when you're a facilitator, you are stimulating local initiatives and you put them in resonance, like uh, Hartmut Rosa would say, right? So you, you want them to connect to each other. So you see that the world of robustness is not, uh, it's not uh, survivalism. Eh? It's not like, you know, the crazy <laughs> people who are, you know, freezing some uh, steaks in their bunkers. And <laughs> it's not that at all, right? You want to be local, uh, you want to be autonomous at the local level, but you want to stimulate the interactions between the different autonomous uh, cells, right, in some ways. And that's the role of the state democracy. Uh, an example for this to show that this can work, uh, it's the, um, uh, the citizen convention that uh, we had uh, here in France uh, uh, recently for the climate. Uh, so you take 150 citizens, you pick them uh, randomly, so you don't take any experts, huh? it's really suboptimal. You even have climate deniers in the, in the mix. And at the end, those 150 people, they are going to agree on 149 propositions and 96% of the, the people are going to agree to sign those 149 propositions. So that's a process based on uh, randomness, on uh, heterogeneity, I mean on uh, incoherence, right? The climate deniers and the climate supporters. All this is producing something that is very robust. It's robust up to the point <laughs> where you need to have a president that is not stuck in the world of performance and you say, well, we're going to choose among those things and, and then it destroyed the entire thing. But the, the fact that it actually was successful up to the point where they proposed those 149 proposition shows that it can, that is, it is compatible with a state democracy. Hello, uh, my name is Karin and I'm from Austria. Uh, thank you very much, it was very interesting. I have a question that kind of connects to the systematic question but also to your example uh, with the research from before because I, I think the notion of leaving optimization behind is very intriguing and also to create research that is in line with robustness is amazing but how would you do that, especially with the current university system, what would you, your advice be to universities or to scholars to oh, actually yeah, yeah. do that? <laughs> Yeah, so the, the current universities, they are uh, conservative, but it's, it's uh, I mean, everywhere. Huh? It's, it's actually, it's almost by default, uh, a researcher is, uh, is uh, very um, competent to convince uh, others, and it's also very competent to convince uh, himself or herself, right? And so that's why it's so conservative, <laughs> the university. It's one way to, to look at it, right? So the, the one way to switch from um, performant or efficient universities to robust universities or research, uh, uh, teaching systems is to switch to uh, f to um, towards uh, citizen science and uh, participative uh, research. So when you do this, you have citizens at the start of the project. So you ask a question with the citizens. So it's slower, more heterogeneous, more viable. You're going to publish in uh, very small journals. Your career is not going to go very far. So it's really the opposite of performance, right? With the current standards, but you promote robustness because now you have a dialogue between science and society. And this is, it's the best answer to, uh, you know, the conspiracy uh, theory and all this, right? We need to have this connection. But I agree with you, and I, I think uh, we, uh, at the university level, I think we need to really um, think that this is a serious uh, change. You know, the last time in France, there was a time where all the universities were closed in France, and that was in 1792, 1792, right after the French Revolution. And that, at that point, uh, the university, all the universities were closed in, on, in one day. Huh? because the universities were teaching uh, theology, uh, rhetorics, uh, I mean, the more traditional uh, knowledge. And in 1792, we started new universities that were towards the new sciences, physics, chemistry, uh, math. So that was a complete switch. And I think today we are living this moment. The universities that are not tackling the societal questions, that are not uh, revisiting, revising the way they are uh, doing their, uh, their job, they're going to go extinct. 
and we're going to switch to new type of universities that are much uh, broader in uh, scope. I shouldn't be too long. <laughs> okay, Very short. My name is David. Uh, I'm from France. I have the impression that there is a concept you are missing. Uh, it's a concept of scale. Mm -hmm. uh, I recommend you a book that you might know that is called Small is Beautiful uh -huh. from uh, an e a famous economist of the 1970s. Because I am a biologist from training and it seems that there are many uh, biological processes or co behaviors that are in a way optimal, mm -hmm. that are trade-offs, that are very well adapted to a given situation, context, and so on. And sometimes even optimizing uh, something that is maximal, so something that sh could be considered as negative. But because there is interaction between the living systems, there is nowhere a situation or a large, very, very, very large uh, uh, living being uh, in a way dominates the other. And th this is a question of scale. So yeah. what do you think? So exactly, so the, the optimum is always the definition of the optimum, right? So if you define an optimum for a very, very small problem, you will find an optimum. So for instance, if I look at the scale of a shark, uh, if I look at the design of a scale of a shark, it's very close to an optimum because in, term, in terms of hydrodynamic, it's, it's almost the best you can imagine. But if you take the entire shark as an animal with its entire metabolism, with its uh, breathing uh, system and everything, it's far from being optimal, huh? very far from being optimal. And so uh, that's a little bit the critic I have with uh, biomimetism so far, is that it's <coughs> been obsessed with the little performance in biology. And so you can always pick certain uh, performance in biology, like in sub, uh, subsystems. But if you look at the entire system, the entire ecosystem, that's even uh, clearer. But even the entire organism, it's never an optimal organism. Take your, uh, your heart, right? The, the, the aortic uh, cross, right? That goes like this and goes down. That's very far from being a performant, right? And we are the top of the evolution, uh, supposedly, right? And so we have a thing that is just bad plumbing, right? This is just uh, inheritance from evolution, right? But it's really bad plumbing, right? So uh, that's, why I, I, that's why I really insist on the <laughs> going away from the optimization. <laughs> but it does, doesn't mean that there's no, uh, it's a little bit like the fever, right? There's some points where we have some um, optimization or some uh, performance. Hello, I'm yeah. Bjarne from Germany. Uh, I'm interested in how do we measure robustness? <laughs> it seems for optimality, uh, for um, for performance, seems pretty straightforward. You set a benchmark and look at it, um, but somehow I feel we have to be able to judge what is robust and what is less robust. Or does the whole idea of measuring go counter the idea of? Robustness and not exactly. So uh, uh, there's, there's one way to do that. So the best way to check if something is robust is to do a stress test. So it's not really an indicator. You just take your system and you take one parameter and you make it fluctuate a lot more than usual. If your system is still uh, viable after this, then it's robust. Uh, but if you start putting indicator of robustness, uh, then uh, you might optimize your indicators and then you're going to narrow down. It's really, uh, but, but uh, you can find some, um, I would say, uh, landmarks of robustness. So diversification, redundancy, I mean, every, all the list huh, of that uh, heterogeneity, all this, that's um, uh, key points that you can see in a system that is likely to be robust. That's all you can say. But if you want to talk to uh, an entrepreneur, for instance, that is obsessed with the key, uh, KPI, huh, the key performance uh, indicator, that is more for the performance, you can say the, the first step is to say, well, but your key performance indicator, your KPI, are only for economic performance. So maybe you want to add social performance, for instance. Then maybe you want to add ecological performance, right? Like, you know, the global performance. When you do this, actually, it's really interesting because then people start to add more and more indicators that are completely contradicting each other. And then at some point, we just say, well, it's impossible, right? And I drop the indicator. And the minute you drop the indicator, you're closer to robustness, actually. <laughs> but it's a path, right? So <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, uh, I'm Celso from Portugal. Um, and I have um, something that was occurring to me during your presentation, and this is um, a sort of ethical problem um, related to acting suboptimally sub and acting robustness. And here I was thinking, in, uh, particularly in the field of development economics. And when you're talking about things where people are very poor and um, well, starving, or, or not to that point, but still we're facing a very big loss of potential in life. Um, 
how can we justify or, sh or maybe we should not, I don't know, but can we justify acting suboptimally when it is faced with a very high human cost? Yep, so uh, that's why I, I, you probably noticed that in the article I use, uh, so I mean we use the suboptimality a lot, and uh, during my presentation I haven't used suboptimality as well, I haven't used resilience, so it's been a bit of an evolution since that uh, article. Uh, when, you, when you talk about uh, robustness, you address uh, primary human uh, pulsion in some ways. You, the question is, how can I last? And how can I transmit things to the next generation? That's the question you ask when you address the question of robustness. This is a very generic question that everyone, it's a universal question. And this is also a question that poor people are asking. Actually, if you do, there's been a lot of studies with people who've uh, investigated very poor communities. And the question was, what do you want in your life? And so people uh, could think, well, they're going to say, uh, I want to, uh, to learn a lot of, I want to gain, a, earn a lot of money. I want to be uh, successful. No, they never said that. The only thing they said, 99% of them, they said, I want my kids to have a better life than me. That's what poor people are saying when you ask them what do they want in their life. That's a question of robustness because it's transmitting, it's, it's really uh, something that is talking to poor people. I agree, suboptimality, I think it's a bit of a clumsy, <laughs> clumsy word because it's negative. It's a bit like degrowth in some ways, right? It's, that's what we'll do anyway. We'll do degrowth, we'll be suboptimal, but it's not creating a desire. Robustness has the power to, to create a, a desire. And I think even to the poor people, actually mostly to the poor people, that's what you want. Right? You want to be sure you have to have a sec mental security to say, it's going to fluctuate, but I'll be, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And that's why I think it's uh, ethically then it works better than suboptimality. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Jean from Colombia. Uh, I have a question. What do you think that uh, what should be the role or what we can learn from the idea of robustness when discussing climate, ch ad climate change adaptation? Because I think that there is a conception sometimes that adaptation is a kind of engineering problem. And actually, there are, there are a lot of discussions about maladaptation that actually you can invest a lot, for instance, con building uh, contention walls to to tackle flooding but at the end in the long term wouldn't be beneficial or actually can create more risk so basically what kind of what other approach for climate change adaptation can we take from this to a little bit to detach from this idea of uh, efficiency and engineering uh, technical solutions thank you yeah it's a, it's a, it's a good question so uh, uh, the adaptation is the world of performance adaptability is the world of robustness you know, adaptation and adaptability, these are two words that look almost the same, they sound almost the same, but they are opposite. Adaptation, it's an arrogant uh, thing, right? Because when you say you want to adapt, you pretend to know what's going to happen. And so that's why uh, the, the examples you took, these are the best answers to the wrong question. That's usually what we do, huh? we provide the best answer to the wrong question. When you're adaptable, you spend more time on questions and you explore many different uh, solutions, so that way you can always be adapted in case uh, the world is changing. But this is, uh, this is robust, right? <laughs> so it's against robust. So it's if you oppose adaptation and adaptability, then you're fine. You can clean out and you can sort out different solutions. Um, hello. Uh, we're still um, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> my, my name is Dara, I'm from Afghanistan. Um, you mentioned the model that uh, we need to uh, change our priorities from uh, economic first to nature first and then to social and economics. <coughs> but my question was, do you think the current world order is um, actually um, uh, what we need in order to go towards <coughs> this? Um, and also, what do you think about the institutional structures, the United Nations and other mm. uh, philanthropic organizations? Are we really in a optimal uh, world order in order to uh, move towards robustness or do we need another type of world order in, or in order to go to towards robustness? Yeah, so I mean, that's a big question, eh? and I'm not a geopolitician, so <laughs> I'm going to give you my opinion as a citizen. Uh, but the, the current world order with the UN, with the big powers, uh, it's definitely the world of uh, performance. Huh? Uh, it's the, the world. So in, in, uh, in French, actually, we have two words uh, for power. So we have pouvoir and puissance, right? And in English, I think there's only one word, power, right? 
But the problem is that uh, pouvoir and puissance, it's very different, right? Uh, so maybe it's going to be difficult in English, but, but the, anyway, so the, 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 the big, uh, I mean, the UN and the, they, they are stuck in the world of performance, definitely. Huh? Uh, I mean, there are some people who are doing good things, but even the, the philanthropy. Uh, so if I, I invite you to watch the YouTube video of um, Rutger Bregman, for instance, when he was in uh, Davos. Uh, and he, uh, he said that the, the first thing you want to do in a world that is uh, facing a lot of crisis is not to increase the number of philanthropy, <laughs> it's to pay your tax. It's to pay your tax. Just pay your tax. And that's, uh, I mean, this video has been uh, viewed a number of uh, thousand times, I don't know how much. But if you pay your tax, you see it's very suboptimal, right? Because you just give your money, you don't know what the state is going to do with it. It's, uh, so we could almost think it's an open bar, right? Like, like it's very uh, variable and everything, right? But at the end, uh, that money is not going to bias, it's not going to distort the system. If you think of the Gates Foundation, for instance, uh, you could think, well, that's the great foundation, lots of money to solve a lot of uh, health issues. Actually, when you read The Lancet, the critic of uh, articles in The Lancet on the Gates Foundation is that it's a big distortion, the Gates Foundation. When you uh, increase the salary of nurses in Africa to uh, increase or to cure AIDS faster, what happens is that you have a lot more nurses that are uh, working on AIDS and lo a lot less nurses working on anything else, right? So this is distortion, right? And so the, the, I agree with you, the current world order is not really stuck, I mean, it's, it's too, uh, too stuck in performance. So my advice to you is to realize, thinking of systems, is that uh, we're shifting from performance to robustness. Anyway, and this is going to happen, we won't have any choice. Huh? It's going to be more and more fluctuating, so it's going, it's going to happen, and it, rather in the short term. The question is, how do systems shift? The answer, they always shift from the margins, never from the art of the system. So the UN is at the art of the system, Bill Gates is at the art of the system, Elon Musk, uh, McKinsey, all these people, they are at the art of the system they will be the last ones to shift. It's going to happen from the margins, because the margins, they are the ones that are the most sensitive to uh, the fluctuation. They are the ones that are much more adapted or adaptable, let's say, to this uh, fluctuation. And they are the ones at the next crisis, at the next fluctuation, that will synchronize, say that that's the new system, and the art will have no choice but either to follow the margins or to die. That's it. So I would not spend too much time fighting the art of the system because it's obsolete. It's obsolete. I mean, we can see it uh, every day, right? It's completely obsolete. But the margins are much more fertile. And they are going to set the new world of uh, robustness. Or you call it as you want, but the world of adaptability. Or <laughs> but that, so yeah, that's right. That, that would be my, I don't want to be too long, but <laughs> there's a lot to say. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Owen from the UK. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned lithium, and my question is on raw materials, um, particularly those materials which are very, very scarce and may only come from very specific mines in very specific regions. How do we deal with those materials in a robust way, especially when we are somewhat locked in to their use? I don't know, in phones, in laptops or other yeah. technologies. So the, in the short term, we are still locked in, in this uh, model, but in the, let's say, midterm, the goal will be to replace <coughs> all these rare earths by bio-based <laughs> molecules. So I can give you an example uh, in my team, actually. So we have a collaboration with a physicist, uh, Thomas Dehoux. So if you take an onion, you know, like a supermarket onion, you open it, and then there's a little uh, membrane inside. So that's an epidermis. And you put it in a microscope, a special microscope, let's say, and you measure the acoustic uh, spectrum. And you'll see that this epidermis of onion is actually absorbing certain uh, acoustic waves, very specific bands. Just to cut a long story short, this is what in your smartphone some rare earths are doing. And so, the <laughs> of course, this is very upstream research, but the long-term goal is to replace all these rare earths by bio-based uh, molecules, including those uh, molecules that, are, have, that have phononic properties or other properties. Right? So that would be the robust way. I'm, I'm not saying it's ready yet, huh? but it's, it's the end goal, let's say. <laughs> Hello, I am yep. uh, Pranandita from India. Very briefly, I'm just trying to understand your evolution analogy. So like you said, like Dawkins, that it's um, blind. So selection, <coughs> I'm thinking specifically of technologies. So you said robustness is the result of selection. 
and that will happen because of fluctuations. So what is your analog for the randomness of mutations, if I understand? Is it that we throw money at any and every creative technology or research <coughs> that somebody comes up with? Yeah, so it's a, a little bit like this, but not in, uh, without any <laughs> citing. So uh, uh, natural selection, let's say natural selection, Darwinian uh, selection, we often uh, say that it's the selection of the most adapted, right? That's what is written a little bit everywhere. But actually, when you read the origin of species, this is not what Darwin said. Huh? Darwin said, uh, if you have uh, satisfying properties, you are selected. Satisfying. So it means that if you have uh, C, <laughs> You, you pass the millions of years, right? You don't need to have an A plus to pass the millions of years. So that's what uh, selection, natural selection is about. So now that we're clear on the fact that you don't need to be the best to be selected, but you just need to be good enough to be selected, then when you do research, when you do uh, innovation, then you can embrace a lot of different options. But there is one thing though, you don't want to use or develop an innovation that is not robust by design. So for instance, if you develop a technology that is dependent on a microprocessor that is uh, made in uh, Taiwan and you're in France, that doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, it has to be autonomous uh, locally. And so then you can really sort out a number of uh, solutions just based on uh, robustness. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm sorry if I'm going to... Uh, so yeah, Ma Max from Germany. I just wanted to ask if... Um, if you, like you have any philosophical influences or you have like some philosophers who are, because like some things you said like recognition as a basic human need or freedom is the insight into necessity it has like very strong parallels to uh, like dialectic philosophy right um, I was just uh, like Hegel you know that's Hegel <laughs> what you were saying so I was just wondering like whether you have influences or you have like somebody uh, who who's like influenced you on, on this thinking yeah, exactly. I, I'm only a biologist. I mean, of course, Michel Serre, but uh, Michel Serre, although is, is a lot into moral, and uh, what I'm doing, I think, is more into ethics, actually. So maybe it's even, even Michel Serre is not really so. I mean, I, I've, I've, I read a number of books. I'm not sure I have one philosopher or philosopher that I, I would put as, uh, for instance, I, I would not be able to make the connection. I would need to dig uh, d uh, deeper on this. Uh, but there's definitely philosophy in, <laughs> in this, but it's a uh, bio-inspired philosophy. So it's probably a bit um, basics. And uh, but more well, basic, but uh, yeah, definitely there are resonance. I mean, I'm happy to discuss further, right? But I, I, I don't think I have. Uh, yeah, it's just uh, yeah, biology and uh, <laughs> what I see as a citizen. I mean, my, what I'm saying is very pragmatic huh, in some ways. Huh? It's fluctuating world robustness, right? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Last question. Yes. Um, I have a question about um, my name is Bobby, and I'm from Bangladesh. Um, Nice, thanks for your nice presentation. Okay. Uh, my question is a bit micro level. Uh, like, uh, suppose my uh, project is uh, going to be operated on suboptimal level. Mm -hmm. So in case of uh, implementation of that project, I obviously need fund. So um, from my perspective, when uh, investor want to judge how this will be, uh, justified, then they always think about the value maximization and optimization of the profit. Mm -hmm. So, um, like, I want to know that how to hold the motivation of that investors to invest uh, in this such project that is uh, going to bring uh, sustainability and resilience in the long term. Thank yeah, you. that's exactly that, actually. So, you, the, it's the risk. So, you, you, what you want to, t to tell your investor is that you've taken care of the risk. But you actually, instead of uh, avoiding the risk, you build your system on the risk. And that, so that means that for an investor, you can say, my project will still be here 50 years down the line. And so an investor that is not completely crazy, that is not completely stupid, even if they want a lot of money in the short term, they still want some projects that are really strong and robust. And so if you can say, and you can argue that your project is robust, they are going to invest. You know, it's a private equity. I mean, this, this kind of uh, project where you have more long-term vision, this has value, huh? and this has increasing value. I can, I can tell you, uh, when I was talking about robustness uh, or suboptimality uh, four or five years ago to uh, CEOs, they were listening to me a little bit like, you know, uh, politely, I would say. Uh, <laughs> nowadays, uh, they do listen to me because they, they've seen the fluctuation. In France, there was the yellow vest, so there was uh, social unrest, uh, there's been the COVID, there's been the Ukraine war, the energy crisis, now Gaza. I mean, it's fluctuation is the norm. 
It's the permanent crisis. And so on in the permanent crisis, uh, when you have a project that is dealing with the level of risk that is robust, that has value. And we, that will have a lot more value in the future. The, the projects that are very performant, we know they're fragile and they are going to disappear. They're going to, at the next crisis, they will, uh, you know, each time they will <laughs> clean, be cleaned, cleaned out. Julio from Mexico. Like, <laughs> actually, I was hesitating like to make my question because, like, I think you kind of like already had answer to it. Like, I would like to pinpoint on like the world that I am imagining from your presentation. It's a very like local development led world, mm -hmm. and you kind of already answer a bit on like the big actors. Uh, but like, I was thinking like. Okay, like the, like how to make the, the shift, and like the, uh, when you, like you were talking about like these big actors and like how like it doesn't work with capitalism, like my mind went to China. We <laughs> did like a very you know like not to, uh, yeah like very state central uh, economy. So I was just wondering how would this like. Would it need to be like only small like communities or like how do you imagine it or so? Okay, so, so uh, th this can be big. So the, the scale can be small and big. Uh, if, you, if I take a biological uh, analogy, uh, you know, uh, a cell in your body, it's a small entity that is autonomous and that is robust. I can pick one cell of your body and I can grow it in a lab and it will survive. So it is autonomous. But of course, it's much richer when it's interacting with a lot more cells than it's in your human body. Right? So it's a little bit the same with the world of robustness. You can have a small entity, so it can be the village uh, strategy if you want. But if you connect all this little um, uh, entity, then you have a massive structure that is modular and distributed. That's the key to robustness, modularity and distribution. You don't want a pyramid. The pyramid is fragile, it's performant, right? Or supposed to be performant. <laughs> Often it's not actually. <laughs> but the, the, the pyramids, whether it's in China, in the US, in France, or in a company, it's always super fragile because uh, it all depends on one head, right? And uh, people are not, they, they have no free speech and everything. It's, it's toxic at many levels. So you just want to have a structure that is modular and distributed, and this can go at any size. Can be small, can be big. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.